Welcome to the 12th annual Kane College of the Arts Convocation. Our thanks to Andrew Earl, pipe major of the USU Scotsman Pipe and Drum Corps. Another round of applause for Andrew, please. Thank you, Andrew. As a land-grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah who have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. These tribes are the Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Indians, Navajo Nation, Ute Indian Tribe, Northwestern Band of Shoshone, Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, South, or sorry, San Juan Southern Paiute, Skull Valley Band of Goshute, and White Mesa Band of the Ute Mountain Ute. We acknowledge that these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as peoples who have cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance, history, experience, and the resiliency of the native people who are still here today. The Kane College of the Arts Visiting Artist and Scholar Series is underwritten by the Marie Eccles Kane Foundation Russell Family, the Tanner Charitable Trust, other generous donors, and differential tuition provided by the students of the college, many of you. Thank you. I'm very pleased to acknowledge the, pres the presence of our president of Utah State University, Dr. Elizabeth Cantwell. Dr. Cantwell, thank you for being with us. Many friends and generous donors to the college without whom we could not do our work on behalf of our students. And of course, to all the students, faculty, and staff who are here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the leadership team of the college, Associate Dean Leslie Brott, Associate Dean Richard Walker, and our department heads. Thank you for put, helping us put this program together today. Thank you all. And to introduce a few of our students to you, I'd like to invite Associate Dean Richard Walker to the microphone. Richard? Hi, everyone. I won't go off script, but I, I almost did. <laughs> At this, <laughs> in recognition of the USUSA Arts Senator and Council. Please stand as I read your name so that I can recognize you, or that we all can recognize you, not just myself. All right, Fran Simpson, our Arts Senator. Caroline Brott. Emily Brooks. Ashley Bra uh, Brown, excuse me. Elsa Cole, Luna Hochschul, Radia Kaplan, Emily Russon, Sadie Stewart, Maddie Stone, Lauren Tugas, Madison Ware, Hope Weaver Ward, and Isabel Wood. Please recognize them, please. Thank you. And this is recognition of our Kane College of the Arts student ambassadors. All right, Claire Armstrong, Ashley Brown, Brooklyn Bullard, Cambry Button, Lily Peterson, Megan Rasmussen, 
Ethan Shaw, Sadie Stewart, Maribel Taylor, Rachel Tillotson, and Hope Weaver Ward. Thank you, everyone. Now, recognition of our Kane Scholars. All right. <laughs> From the Department of Art and Design, Abby Allen, Maddie Anderson, Rachel Barlow, Alice Hall, Lily Peterson, Sadie Stewart, Kinsley Todd, Annalise Vasquez, M.K. Wetzel, and Caitlin White. All right, let's give them applause. Really. Stay standing. All right. Now for the Department of Music, we have Samuel Cooper, Ellie Evans, Campbell Helton, Ella Larson, Kimberly Lewin, Ian Parvin, Emma Rose Santa Maria, Elena Smith, Valerie Zerdi, and Chris Williams. Chris Parvin. <laughs> and from the Department of Theater Arts, we have Arden Fair, Maya Gatherin, Levi Hopkins, Natalie Lingardo, Jordan Lockwood, Emma Loven, Brighton McDonald, Jonah Newton, Sarah Palazzotto, <laughs> I practice too. That's the bad part. All right. And then Rachel Tillotson. All right. Bless everyone. That's all, all of us go. And if we could recognize all the students, please stand again. All the students who were recognized here today. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage four of our outstanding student performers. Please uh, join me in welcoming the Kane Quartet under the direction of the Fry Street Quartet. The members of the quartet are Emma Thackeray and Carissa Davenport on violin, Ian Parvin, viola, and Matthew Huff on cello. They'll be performing Danza de los Muñecos from Milagros for string quartet by our guest composer, Gabriella Lina Frank. Following the quartet's performance, Rebecca McFall, a member of the Fry Street Quartet, will introduce our guest for this evening. Please join me in welcoming the Kane Quartet.
Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. We're so thrilled to have Gabriella Lina Frank here with us for this convocation, and even more so for this multi-year residency that we're just concluding this, um, this semester. So Gabby has been kind of in our lives now since 2019. And, um, and I'm just gonna say a few things that I'm pretty sure, sorry. Okay, I'll just keep squatting. <laughs> uh, a few things that she might not say, which is that she's incredible. And through these last years, every one that she's touched has been left with some sort of transformational mark in their thinking, in their musicianship, in the way they approach their art form. And we have been so fortunate to have her in our midst um, over this time. And um, really, I just wanted a chance for all of us here to say thank you. Thank you so much. I have one more thank you, and that is for my colleague, Brad Otteson. So it was Brad's idea to reach out to Gabby those years ago, and he'd known Gabby years before, and found her compositional voice and her, her whole being inspirational, and knew that we needed to work together. And so he reached out, and I think, Gabby, you were passing through the area and stopped in the summer of 2019. And once you know Gabby even a little, that you understand that there is no shortage of imagination or ideas or possibilities or energy for all of the above. And so things got started. And, um, and Brad has really been the unsung hero of, of uh, behind the scenes, organizing, facilitating, keeping things on track, reaching out. So let's just take a second to say thank you to Brad. <laughs> And finally, my job is to introduce Gabby, but fortunately we have a short video that's gonna do a great job of that, much more interesting than me reading highlights from her unbelievably lengthy bio. <laughs> so this is our chance to um, get to know a little bit about her background and then get to hear from Gabby herself, which will um, be a memorable and wonderful opportunity for all of us here. So once again, thank you, Gabby, for being here. And um, I'll hand it to the video. My heritage, I think, is so distinctly American. I mean, where else but in the United States are you gonna find a woman whose mom is an immigrant and she herself is of Spanish, Indian and Chinese ancestry who finds a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx. <laughs> and then they make their home in Berkeley in the 60s. You know, I was always the musical one in the family. So there's a real musical gene. My grandmother certainly had that. And then it showed up in her Peruvian American granddaughter and we had an instant chemistry. And these are some of my fondest memories. I have a lot of little bits of music and melodies and rhythms and, and revelations that I've made in the course of writing symphonies from years ago. I have like 50, 60 binders of ideas and materials. They're all homeless before they find a project or a piece of music that they can take root in. And I succeed if I mine for my own stories. If I'm trying to imitate somebody else, I'm gonna run out of ideas right away. I think actually defying tradition can be one of the best ways to honor it. And a way to liberate your voice is not to try and do things that they were done before. My musicians have been really hip. They have been really game to take on new sounds and they like difficult things if there's a purpose. There's a sense of being a, a champion, you know, and to tell an exciting story. I 
always intended for this academy to be a safe space for everybody. The vision of this is to make diversity and diverse voices truly this Jesse Jackson inspired rainbow coalition of people that really can, you know, be a family together. A typical day starts with pulling out composers out of bed early. And I put them in the kitchen with our chef. And they learn about foraging and they learn about sustenance, whether it comes in the shape of food or in music. And then we work for the rest of the day on music. Right before measure 80, and then we'll do each of those variations one by one, if that's mm -hmm. okay. The work is about bringing into fruition the composer's own pieces of music. It's not about making them sound like anybody else, although they can draw inspiration from people that inspire them. And often they're nervous because they might be writing for a performer that's well known. They have all their CDs of that performance. Suddenly, that performer is shining all of that attention onto fledgling ideas of theirs. And you can see their confidence grow and they're collaborating together and they realize that they are colleagues. So an important part of this is not just technical. They're also about confidence and they're also about them peering at themselves, looking at their stories and feeling like they are very necessary stories. Showing them that the sky is not gonna fall when they do something they've never seen before is an important part of what we do have them trust their training, and now say something new. We see artists as very necessary for a productive and thriving and imaginative and creative society, that they will play better and write more imaginative music if they think about as broad an audience as possible. My hope for the future is that the people that are coming up after me now will go farther than me. Building society and your vision of what you know to be true and good, that means not following the models necessarily that are provided. As dire as this world looks right now, it is asking for a really bold approach. This is what it looks like when the time is now to do things differently. Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be back on campus again. The pandemic really redefined what the residency was going to be, but in many ways we are able to go deeper. And I appreciate so much the hospitality that I have felt for all the years that I have been coming. Um, I have to say that this residency has been truly unusual for the depths of the conversations that I've been having with each visit, whether the visit was by Zoom or in person, or even when the visits were done in Boonville, California, where I live, when the Kane Scholar a couple years ago made a trek over. And at the spine of all of these conversations and the concerts and the performances and the events and the panels and the coffees and the good food, at the spine of all of it has been this question of what is our relevance? in the 21st century in this society today. The society that we're looking at, the world that we're looking at today is not a steady one. I think regardless of your demographics, your political persuasions, your religious faith, your socioeconomic class, that we can all agree that the world is not steady. And it's precisely at this moment that we may be asking, what is the purpose of a 21st century artist now, a classically trained musician, an actor, a, a designer? Why are we needed? Would it be better to go to law school? Would it be better to run for city council? Would it be better to find some other way to be useful? I continue to believe, even though I had my eye at law school, believe it or not, when I was younger and didn't think I was gonna become a professional musician, that musicians are important. And you heard in the video my alluding to the fact that we have stories to tell 
These are important stories to tell. And the stories that we tell comes from the imperative of witnessing what's going on around us. We are cultural witnesses. So though this very lofty title is Composer's Cultural Witness is what defines my time on stage for you now, really it should be artists as cultural witness. And I hope that these few remarks that I have for you today will give you the imperative and the inspiration to go and find your way to do this too. I will also say that I have never witnessed a residency aside from these kinds of conversations that we have, have, uh, we have been having. I never witnessed such a residency when I was in school. So I came of age in the 90s. And in 1990, I was a 17-year-old freshman at Rice University, having only months earlier made the decision to go into school to study music. I actually thought, because this was the late 80s when I was thinking about applying for college, that I was going to be a political science major. I was taking Russian, believe it or not, at Berkeley High School, because we had all these cool UC Berkeley students who were studying Russian literature and language coming down, and we wanted to be like them. But also, in 1989, the wall came down in Europe. We had the Chinese student protest in Tiananmen Square. We had Gorbachev, who I found fascinating with his, his principles of glasnost and perestroika. So I had my political awakening during this time. And in order to bolster my college applications in the summer of 89, I saw an, an ad in the newspaper, because it's before the time of the internet, advertising a summer course in music composition. Now, you saw those pictures of me falling asleep at the piano when I was a little girl. So the piano to me was like a piece of furniture. <laughs> you know? And it was something that was very ordinary in my house. And I was the musical one. I was always the one that would gravitate towards the piano when I didn't want to do my homework or I wanted to bother my brother because he thought it was noise. I mean, it was something that was so ordinary in that way. And I definitely did inherit a, a, a musical gene in the Frank side of the family. And when I took this summer course at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, a major institute of music on the West Coast that I had never heard of, it just blew my little mind to see the school with a piano in every room. And I remember staff lines painted on the chalkboard. It was painted on. It was something about that, the permanence of it. And textbooks, instead of horrible algebra and chemistry, <laughs> it was like music in there. And I realized there was this tradition and my world changed. And I saw child prodigies for the first time, and I realized that I was also behind, that I didn't have the skill set that many of my peers, other teenagers, had. But I fell hard. I fell in love hard with this endeavor of creating music and watching my peers put in their time and their effort and imagination and the counsel that they would give me. Now, when people come together and they counsel, and they may disagree, but they come to a consensus, this is at the heart of diplomacy. And what music does is a metaphor for how human beings listen, connect, how they document their stories, and how they come to consensus. This is how we get along. In a concert, when you see something like Danza de los Muñecos, you're seeing the end result of collaboration we hold you for two hours in a concert because by God, we're gonna, we want you to listen to the stories that we bring to you. Music making is a powerful act. And I saw that, I felt that when I was 17 years old, thinking I was just going to decorate my CV so I could get into college. Instead, the decoration was in my DNA. And so without knowing what the conservatory life was like, I just jumped in. I'm very lucky that I got accepted to Rice University, the Shepherd School of Music. So in 1990, the building had just, the new building had just opened up. And the composition department was not quite as high powered as it is now. But the performance department, particularly the strings and the piano, was incredible. So here I was, a young composer who really wasn't a very good reader of music notation. I had a good ear and a perfect pitch. So when my piano teacher would play things to me, I would just kind of pick it up and not really read. I mean, I was hustling for the first couple years of my undergrad to get fluent. And I just dove into the insular but wonderful world of classical music. 
it wasn't until about halfway through my training when I was a junior that I began to feel some misgivings. And I would dismiss it, and then it would come back, and then I would dismiss it. And I started to realize, wow, I'm a Latina woman. My mother comes from this beautiful nation of Peru, and there is nothing about this at the school. Dare I expect them to provide me an education in Peruvian music or music from other continents? And I realized that as much as I loved the repertoire of classical music that I actually grew up with, there wasn't necessarily a commensurate level of love back towards my cultures. And what was I gonna do about that? The other thing that I felt disloyal for thinking was, I don't wanna do competitions. <laughs> I don't wanna go to New York City and, and try to get on the new music gig circuit there. And I don't really wanna do these music festivals. I'm kinda scared about that. I don't wanna go to Europe. It, does that mean I'm not deep or I'm, I don't understand classical music? There were so many of these things. And I was thinking, look, we're in Houston. There's a lot of you know, children, white, black, Latino, that can't get music lessons. I wanna work with them. I have a civic initiative. Does this mean that I'm not as deep on my art? So this began a period of time, which I kept on the down low. <laughs> that I was an ESL tutor for their largely Central American janitorial help. I excelled even more on chamber music. I had a, a piano quartet and I had a piano trio that I was really tight with for several years. We were super serious and we played a lot at a big rep. Back in the day I could really play. And I did that because I loved it, but also almost as cover. <laughs> so I could have the space to investigate what am I doing here? Why, where are these misgivings coming from? And what I was feeling, I think, are the tenets of what's needed if you're gonna be a cultural witness. Because once you have misgivings that there's an incomplete picture you're being asked to paint, that there's more for you to do, that school is really just a, a launching pad, those misgivings will form the imperative to go and address them, to resolve the conflict. And in doing so, for me, I began to travel. I began to take up more experiences outside of what the conservatory could give me, but I also went deeper, conversely, with what it could give me. So by the time I was in the doctorate program at Michigan, I was volunteering at a men's prison, going almost every Saturday night, working mostly with a, a Latino group. And this was strictly speaking with a correctional facility, so inmates would stay there for a while before they were, um, they were routed to different parts of the state. And they did this to break up gang alliances. And my parents were saying, do you really need to do this? I mean, this is dangerous, isn't it? And, um, and I felt this imperative to do it. So I would go from my set theory, <laughs> uh, atonal theory class, and then try and explain, explain 12-tone row to the prison inmates. And I remember coming up with the explanation saying, well, um, so there's this theory that, you know, there, there are 12 notes in the scale, and um, this theory is that, you know, when you hear a song and somebody sings a wrong note, well, in this theory, there are no wrong notes. You get to say all of them. And I remember <laughs> somebody saying back to me, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, you know? <laughs> Of course there are wrong notes, you know. And I was just thinking, we're really mesmerized. It's wonderful, I love this world. You can get lost in it and you can stay in it. But I needed to engage. Engagement with the, with the larger world was something that I felt was an imperative. After all, we musicians, you gotta remember, we artists, we actors, we musicians, we designers, we're superheroes to people who are not creative in this way. The, the, the things that we can draw, the moods we can take on in drama, the rhythms we can clap, this makes us a superhero. You gotta understand, once you get out of this environment, and once you have a superpower, you have leverage. You have leverage to command the world to listen, to watch, and to revel, to, to revel in your abilities. So once I was at Michigan, I began to also travel in Latin America. And this was something I kind of put off. I was afraid to. I was very comfortable in my native language of English. Um, I had figured out the classical music world. 
And my mother had never gone back after she came to, to the United States. She finally went back my first year in a doctor program after 30 years away. And when she came back, she had a, a video, one of these old um, 90s style camcorders, and she played me a video of what she had seen and of my very large family. So mom comes from a family of 14 brothers and sisters. And there were two sisters that went north. One went to Canada, and she went to Berkeley. So I had something like 76 cousins, <laughs> first cousins. And my brother and I are the exotic wing of the family. <laughs> We're the one that have Jewish ancestors, grew up in the West Coast in California and doing classical music. My brother's a neuroscientist. So, I mean, it was just mind boggling for my family. So I said, oh my God, I gotta go. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really remembering that I grew up listening to a lot of Peruvian music. We went to Peruvian music folkloric clubs and I, as a little kid, was mixing up the styles. So you saw, you saw um, the footage of the string quartet side by side with the Sambonia players, the panpipe players there. And I was seeing that style of music without the string players when I was a little kid. But if I saw something like, um, uh, charango guitar, which is like the Andean version of the ukulele, played like this, I would take this and go to the piano and just kind of and make the piano sound like it was an Andean indigenous instrument without shame, without thinking this is not culturally correct. I was already telling a story. I was already distilling, trying to make sense of this. And now it's what I do as a professional, and you saw some of that. So I began to travel in Latin America, and I wish I could tell you that it was an easy experience. It was not the magical homecoming that I thought it would be, that I would be with my people and fellow shorties, and you know, that everything would, would look like, you know, this is my motherland. I was a foreigner. It was hard. First of all, believe it or not, it didn't occur to me to get my Spanish up. So I walked in and I thought just magically there was gonna be a little translator and I would just be fluent and one with my family and it was like silencio. <laughs> you know? So I had to really learn Spanish and over the years I'm, I'm not terrible at um, reading indigenous languages and the main one in Peru now is, uh, is Quechua and I'm pretty good at, at stumbling through that. But it took time. And then I realized, oh my God, the land is just rejecting me. I can't eat the food without getting sick and I can't drink the water without getting sick and even the sun is like burning my skin. And, and it, was really, it was really difficult, but I kept going back all through my 20s and all through my 30s. And I've made many, many trips. And what makes them really wonderful is that I went with my mother. So in grad school, here I am hoping to delve more into Latin American idioms to see what does that mean for a Latina in the diaspora, the daughter of a Jew, daughter of a Catholic woman, an immigrant also. What did this mean? And it wasn't like there was a lot of support, financial support for me to do this because nobody goes to Peru for classical music. They go to Austria, they go to Paris. And so I had to find ways to, to financially make that work on my own. And I'm so glad that I did. That the misgivings to, to trust that the school could define my path for me, that that would be enough. I'm so glad that I took the resources and the wonderful teachers and the peers, some of them were in the video that I went to school with that helped me launch my academy. I didn't think that was enough. So when I graduated from, from Michigan with my doctorate, I thought about going to New York City, and I didn't, and I'm very glad I didn't. And I came home to the Bay Area. I had a little bit of money that I had saved. I learned how to invest in stock, because one of my best friends was an economics major, and she had to take an investment course, and they were required to buy one share. And so in solidarity, because we're all poor, so this was you know, a real act of solidarity, I bought a share and over several years, it actually did well enough to share a split. So I had a little bit of money. One of the things I think that would help musicians is, is to have a personal finance course that was part of their curriculum as well. But I continued to work and unexpectedly, my career took off. I had reconciled myself to, if I'm gonna do my, my, my little stories, 
and put them in music, it means I'm not going to have a career. It's not what the industry wants. I might get a job at a little liberal arts school that's really, you know, misfitty and does a lot of interdisciplinary work, and I'll be a beloved professor, and I'll music make in this underground circuit of the university circuit or at a liberal arts college circuit. But the opposite happened. I got signed on to a major agent, major publisher. The gig started coming. I didn't see other people of color around me, and I felt like I had to not only explore for my own benefit, but I needed to represent that I had the possibility of opening doors and redefining what it means to be an American. I feel like my story is a deeply, deeply American story. So 20 years would pass like this, 20 years, and I was very focused on exemplifying in a body of my own work, traveling through essentially every state of the US, traveling in Europe, and traveling Latin America. I have a major career. I just finished a big opera. I've written and been performed by all of the, the major American orchestras, and now Europe is, is beckoning. And then something happened. In 2016, in the waning months of the election between Clinton and Trump. If you throw your mind back to that time, it was a shocking time. The level of discourse was getting lower and lower. The division between people, even within families, was getting greater and greater. We've become kind of numb to it, I think, in a year since. In 2017, the relentless fire seasons began in my beloved home state of California. And I was shocked that this was not routinely discussed. And I felt like it was my job to use the platform, such as it was, to address the stories of being a daughter of a Jew, a daughter of a woman from a whole country, for, to address the climate crisis. I needed to witness what was going on around me. During the same summer in 2016, on a cross-country trip with my husband, I was accosted at a truck stop. I had never experienced violence like that for no reason. I came out just fine, but shaken from the whole experience. And there was a large white man um, who stood over me as he knocked me down and showed me his gun and my whole world shifted. And as I was walking out, my husband knew something was going on, and we drove away. I said, I'm not doing enough. We had just bought a new home in Mendocino County. We had left the Bay Area, and it was a large home with acreage. <laughs> and I said, I'm gonna open up a school. We're gonna pay for it. I'm gonna fundraise. And the video you saw of the musicians working together and the diversity of that group, I want to be able to bring Americans together from every faith, every political persuasion, every demographic, and we're going to focus on the connection. We're going to focus on telling stories. We're going to do it with excellence. I'm going to push them. I'm going to help them get a banging skill set that they can really tell these stories well. And with that simple, First time doing it. So what you saw was the very first gathering ever of my academy. We had no website. Because I said, what if I hate this? What if I'm, I'm terrible at it? What if I don't enjoy it? But from the first day, I was hooked. And it's been transformative to not just explore my stories and hope that they can serve themselves up for a discerning public and be of service but I am now inundated with the stories of my composers. So we're only six years old, my nonprofit. We're now considered a major institution, you know, as far as bringing composers through. We're funded with, a, with, a, with private donations, I'm constantly fundraising, but we also have, as our financial backbone, a large Mellon grant, and Mellon's one of the biggest funders. Um, and we were told that we were the youngest nonprofit to get something like this. I said, wow, I must have tapped into a vein. 
And I think it's because I wanted this to be a cohort of artists that was diverse from the get-go. And one of the things I will tell them, I will say that your stories are important. I don't think your ideas are flawed. Maybe your execution is what we can work on. Maybe this shouldn't be in a violin line. Maybe it should be in a viola line. Or maybe you need to work out the artificial harmonics. Or I think the climax comes too soon. It doesn't feel earned. Or you know, we can look at the aesthetic part of it. So what started off as just a core exercise of creating music with great performer mentors and getting a really nice recording. Then <laughs> all these spin-offs came off as I realized I don't want this institution to be just a passing, a pass through. I want to stay with these composers so I can help make a bridge between their stories that they're just beginning to get together and the world. So now we have a very vibrant alum society. We're still working with composers from that cycle that you saw six years on. We now can co-commission, and we've done a lot of that under the stewardship of the Fry Street Quartet, where we co-commission chamber works, and many of you have been involved in that. We also co-commission orchestral works. Our largest commission is $20,000 plus copy money. One of the things that I did was I leveraged my career into my tiny <laughs> little train that thinks it can. And, and my staff is comprised of composers that have come back to help me do the admin of it. We have a climate program. This is one of our jewels. It's called Composing Earth. It's a two-year commitment for my composers, where in the first year, once a month, we read books and articles about the climate crisis. And in that group, it's a discerning group. They don't always agree. We practice coming to consensus on one of the most difficult challenges ever to face humanity. And I tell them, you are the most important generation of artists that has ever lived. This generation of humanity, what we do determines the state of the planet for the next. No other generation has ever had such power. And in the first year, we spend time doing this, and we work with a Utah State University professor, Rob Davies, who is the husband of Rebecca McFall, who has become a very important mentor for us. Each Wednesday over the year, a member of the Composing Earth cohort, and typically between six and 10 alums from my academy participate, sends out a love letter to the group. I just tried a composting toilet for the first time. It wasn't as gross as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Somebody else says, you know, when I talk about the climate crisis to my friends, they look away. They don't want to talk about it. But man, when I talked about it to my grandma, she was so cool. She was like all over it. <laughs> and getting a hug once a week through the year helps each of my composers realize these little things like cool grandma or composting toilet. There's a piece of music in that. There's a piece of music in that. And the stories that have come out are incredible. One of my composers has written about her mining family. She comes from a ge many generation of miners. Another composer has written about his grandfather in New Mexico and how the, the practice, the annual seasonal practice of irrigating the farm was something he thought was just what grandpa did, but he realized that Grandpa was fighting the environmental changes already. My Hawaiian composer writes about the concept in nature, if you look, you find beautiful geometric shapes, just naturally, and how that has been disappearing in the advent of the climate crisis. My Iranian refugee composer, who fled to Canada with his, friend, with his family, talks about the ninth century Persian text that predicted environmental decline. Composing is not just about rhythm and counterpoint and melodies. These pave the way for these stories. And the stories are rooted in looking at your background, looking at what's going on around you. You're leaving a document for the next generation, a document of your time, but you're also laying a call for action for your current generation for your current community. In Composing Earth, we also talk about how to give an interview. 
We talk about how to um, lead, a more, lead a more ethical lifestyle. Can you fly less? Can you ask for what an organization's green travel budget is? There are so many things that my academy has been able to do in the spirit of enabling our storytellers. And I realized that I was building, I had been building an academy that I would have thrived to have, whether I was an undergrad or a graduate student or in the early years of training. One of the things that I really love about this academy is that I've been able to take it on the road with me. And a really great example of that is what has transpired with my residency here the last few years at Utah State University. I went back and I counted up how many of my composers have by Zoom and in person interacted with members of the Keynes College. And it's well over a dozen, super diverse, super ethical, super witnessy. <laughs> they better be after coming through my academy. And I have loved that so much that under the vision of Brad and the other members of the quartet, that we could have these conversations. This is not like a residency that I ever witnessed when I was in school, but now you can. It's on you to take yourself seriously like this, to know that this is your world to build. You're supposed to fashion this world in your vision. You get to do that. You're supposed to go farther than my generation. My generation is supposed to go farther than the generation before. And as long as my generation's alive, we'll walk alongside you as long as we can. But this is your world to build. And you will do that if you see your training and your curriculum here. I know you're super busy, but you see it as just the starting point. You find your angels, you find your peers that you're gonna grow old with. Again, I started my academy with schoolmates, with people that I took ear training with. This community right here is your second family. and You're gonna change the world through your stories, through your cultural witnessing. So, go, <laughs> do it. I wanna see what you do. It's the best work. It's needed work. Thank you so much. actually have a good amount of time, 15 or 20 minutes, in which we can do a Q&A. And I love Q&As. I love to hear what you're thinking and how are we doing this? Are there, oh yes, there are the microphones at the front. So if anybody has a comment or a question, we have 20 whole minutes. We're just going to hold you for 20 minutes. So you might as well fill it up with some commentary. Do you want to come to the front? And we'll lead off with, we'll lead off with you, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what your own journey was to figuring out the confidence that you have in yourself, because obviously you're teaching other people, and I would imagine you had moments of self-doubt or wondering if you were good enough, and so I'm wondering what you said to yourself and what that journey looked like for you. I mean, we, comp we, we musicians are terrible at self-doubt. I mean, we're so, I, mean, I should say we're so good at it. <laughs> it's terrible that we're good at it, you know, and um, how we feel. This goes into a whole nother, um, I'm so glad you're bringing it up. It goes into the whole question of shame, the shame that we feel. And there's so much, unfortunately, shaming in just the culture of classical music. That's the field I know. I don't know about drama. I assume it's somewhat similar. Um, so the shame when you hit a wrong note, mm -hmm. the shame that you only practice four hours instead of like the planned eight, mm -hmm. the shame that 
you're a silly musician, you're not deep or profound, you know? And when you have that kind of shame that's going to turn off any impulse to be a witness, like who are you to think you have something to say to the world? So this is a very private kind of battle. And I certainly felt inadequate when I was younger. I fell in with a group of misfits, and we were all just misfitty in some way, and I think you can't do this alone. So that's gonna be the first thing I'm gonna say, is you need to be social with your fellow misfits. You need to hang out, you need to complain, you need to like, you know, practice getting nervous in front of another, like set up mock um, performances, whatever it is, you know. And you need to realize that you're not a superwoman. You're a person, you're a human, right? If you had no fear, to me, that you must be a monster. I don't know anybody that is able to, to go through the artistic development practice without dealing with the question of shame. Um, and then sometimes you're gonna have really hard experiences with say a guest artist that says something and it cuts, or a bad review, or maybe even a teacher that's not the right one for you. You're gonna have to protect yourself, and it may mean doing something that's scary, like leaving a studio, um, telling the conductor you don't wanna play that concerto, are you willing to lose the gig because you know it's not right for you. So I only you know, try to find your mechanisms to get your confidence up. I was really good at surrounding myself with people that made me laugh. The laughter, I'm just wired to laugh. And laughter is really, oh, that's still, I felt some energy right there. That was really, <laughs> and I wasn't alone, you know, so. Yeah, this is what you need. You need to feed off of this kind of energy. Um, and then you need to ask questions like this. So how do you deal with this? How do you do? And I've had, if we had more time, I could regale you with a multitude of stories <laughs> in which I was put down in public, or I was, there was a real racial bent you know, um, with a conductor. It says, you're the maid, right? And in front of the whole orchestra, makes a ha 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 joke, and I have to just keep my dignity together. And then I make him sweat because the music's really hard, you know? <laughs> And so you can take your moments of satisfaction, but in, you know, privately and maintain your dignity. And you're a work in progress. I didn't come out decorated like this. <laughs> I came out like that little toddler sleeping on the piano. You know, it's like something very relatable in humans. So um, just step by step, believe in yourself, surround yourself with other people that believe you, and get yourself out of situations that are not good for you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Mm. Is that Sergio? Yeah. In hearing you talk about the music composition program in California, and seeing here that there is so much growing interest from students and faculty in composition. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about how does it work? For example, somebody who might want to go and study over there, what is it, what does that involve? Do people live there for how long? Or do you uh, do So this is my learning? academy specifically. Yes. So we're a growing academy, remember we're only six years old. And in the first round of composers, um, I took only conservatory brats. You know, people that were really coming through the conservatory and really knew it and I could find them. But I did have a couple of jazzers in there, which I really love because a few years before I started the academy, I was a mentor at something called the Jazz Composers Orchestra Institute. Basically, um, like boot camp for jazz musicians that want to learn how to write symphony orchestras, run by the American Composers Orchestra, which is a major institution in New York City. And because I have a number of orchestral works under my belt, they asked me to be a mentor. And I remember I went in thinking this was like Orchestra 101, and I really didn't realize that these were my colleagues just, you know, crossing over into jazz. They were really, really good. And I felt so dumb that I didn't hang out with them for several days. I was back in my hotel room just throwing out my, my, my lesson, my lecture that I was gonna do for them. And um, I was very impressed. So Don Norfleet that some of you worked with, K 
came from that. That's how I met her, at the Jazz Composers Orchestra Institute. And she did not have a typical you know, training. Afterwards, I started finding composers a lot through referral um, who didn't even use notation, who never went to a music school. Um, and so through my academy, we got them tutors because I asked people and say, you know, I think you'll have more power if you're able to do improvisation and can also notate your ideas. And as a former improviser, I'll help, I'll help you over the hump. So we've become, I mean, I hate adjudicating, and we have hundreds of applications with each round. It's really tough for me. My husband says I'm going to need to get a therapist because I just want to save all the puppies. That's what it sounds. That's what it feels like to me. And it's, so I keep opening up another cycle that we're going to do to get six more composers in my staff. It's like no more. We can't do. It. So what we're doing now is we're going even smaller now because we have so many alums that we continue to work with. And I want to keep us small. I don't want to franchise you know, the academy. I want to keep it small so I get to know everybody as I do now really, really well. We're beginning to offer classes for, the, for every composer at large. And if you go on the website of the Gabriella Lina Frank Creative Academy of Music, it's really, just do my name and you'll find it. Um, in about two months, we're going to announce courses that anybody can take. And these will be one-day seminars at first practicums in which, say, I and Charles Overton, a really amazing African-American 26-year-old, he's a baby, 26-year-old jazz harpist. We're going to look at music that emerging composers have written. We're going to do a practicum, show why it works. And then he's going to present harp pieces he thinks every composer should know. So it's a practicum that anybody can benefit from. We're only going to accept now between four to eight actual fellows a year. But my hope is to build up these classes with us at least one a month, tackling a range of topics. We don't have the resources of a major university, but I can give you some thoughts. How are we doing on time? We just check. Yes, we have a little time. I can give you some thoughts as to how I think composers should be trained. So you're getting a sense now that I think composers are storytellers. So I think it's really good if they take history classes, they take creative writing class, they take a, uh, a cinema class and talk about eight films of our, of, our, of our cultures, and not just here in the US, but Bollywood and Mexico, and, and really learn to look at how stories have been distilled within the art forms. But when I was in school, and I would compare my curricular training with what, say, a violinist got. I was like, wow, we composers don't get a lot of love. <laughs> so a violinist gets the weekly private lesson that a composer gets. But let's look at that lesson. Imagine a violin lesson where the student comes in, they put the violin down on the table, and the teacher also puts their violin down on the table. And for the whole lesson, you don't play anything, you just talk about it. You talk about that awesome vibrato you're gonna do. You talk about how clean that shift is gonna be to get into position. You do that for an hour, and the teacher at the end of it says, great, go do that for a week and come back and we'll talk again. That's a composition lesson. <laughs> you don't hear anything come to life. There are no actual musicians. You look at the score, there's a lot of talking. Now, in a violin lesson, your teacher will probably have the instrument out. They'll put their hands on your hand. They'll have you do it again. You're not expected to sound that great right away. The idea is that you're given the tools to go away for a week. In my academy, we compose side by side. Even if it's just for 10 minutes, I'll say, OK, here's the goal. We have a B flat and a trumpet, and I want to get to the first four bars at a mala four. You've got 10 minutes. Do it. You don't have to script out every note but come up with ideas, and then we talk about the virtues of it. And I do it with them. Nobody's expected to sound good. But we do compose side by side. And I learned that directly from being a performer. I didn't learn that through my composition training at the school. So that's just the lesson. The violinists also get studio class. Maybe there's string-wide department class. So composers, we have something called comp seminar, which is routinely despised. It's just never taught well for some reason. The violinist may also get 
violent literature, maybe to get the audition licks down. We don't have contemporary music literature. The violinist gets chamber music with coachings. We don't get no chamber music. We don't get no coaching. The violinist has orchestra three times a week. Imagine if I could have had orchestra three times a week, and I just wrote four bars of music, and I just heard it just once. Can you just read it? I would come out knowing how to write for symphony. The composers don't come out with this. We don't have a concerto competition. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. And yet, we're expected to do a graduating recital. We often, in top of tuition, we have to hire our players. We don't know how much rehearsal time they'll give. We don't get no love. So in my academy, with the, you know, it's very small. We don't have the resources of a major university. I try and address all of that in my way, all of that, until we get to the point in which we have as much reverence for the future as we do for the past in the conservatory. The reason why it's this way is that we're building people to play the repertoire of the past into institutions and organizations and structures that exist in the industry, the orchestra, the opera house, uh, competitions. We don't have that kind of structure for composers unless you value contemporary music. It's shifted. Contemporary music is more valued. I'm seeing my composers are starting to become very overworked. There are not enough composers ready to go. And I think the answer resides in the conservatory. And this is a very long answer to what I think is a, with a very specific question. We may have time for one more. Yeah. Hi. I was really, I, I found it very impactful when you were talking about um, taking civic initiative and embodying being a cultural witness, right? And to me, I think a lot of that has to do with communication. And so I'm wondering, in your experience as an educator, as someone who's opened an academy, and as someone who composes, right? Um, how would you advise uh, communicating effectively to be a cultural witness? I'm, I'm a painter myself, right? So there's a lot of conversation between the viewer and what I create, and a lot of nonverbal communication there, but there also has to be a lot of verbal communication and the execution of that work. So what sort of advice do you have there? What a great question. So wait, wait, wait stay here, because I may, I may, I may. Okay. Don't Sorry. go. <laughs> it's not going to be that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so by communicating me, like the verbal communicating, like what you just did for me, yeah. verbal communication. Right. I have a hard time with that personally. I wouldn't so have been able to tell. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think, I think you did a great job. So I think you, were, you excelled in this moment because you believed in it. Right. That there was an urgency. You really want to know. So I have composers that are very shy. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I used to be shy. But um, the imperative of my work said I can't be shy. I have to be able to be a, 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 an effective verbal communicator and a writer as well. Mm. And believe <laughs> I read some books. And some of it was like too woo for me, and I was like, I'm not gonna, you know, okay. But then there were some really good tips, and it was things like, if you only practice how to talk about your work whenever you have an, an exhibition, which may not happen like routinely, mm -hmm. you, the number of times you get to practice communicating about your work is not gonna coalesce into something that really evolves your practice, if that, so you have to create these opportunities. Right. So, you could start with something as humble as go into the bakery, they've got some good muffins. You look at the person behind you and say, boy, that lemon poppy, I'm gonna get that one. What do you think? That's communicating. You're breaking the barrier. It really is. It's not like about your painting. We gotta, we gotta humanize it. We really do, you know, and you don't have to like solve cancer in that conversation, you know. But you need to break it down into something that is routine. Um, do you say hello to somebody in the elevator when they come and you say, hey, you do? Oh, yeah. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> How about when they're leaving? Have a nice day? Yeah. You do too? <laughs> yeah, well, and I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is more like the difficult conversations. Because I feel like superfluous communication is, is all right. I can manage that. But, but like when it comes to civic engagement specifically and being a witness to one's culture, those are the conversations that I have a hard time with. If it's surface Can you give level, me an example? Okay. Like um, an example, like, like one of your art, one of your pieces. Describe like one of your, your painter, you said? Yeah, yeah. Des 
describe to me one of your paintings. Sure. So. I, personally, I engage with a lot of formal quality and the, the, the relation between man and nature and how um, sort of as humans, we've like colonized this natural space, um, but we see these two entities living within each other, right? So I paint a lot of suburban spaces. You and, paint a lot of suburbans? Yeah, yeah, right. So like trees with clouds and telephone poles, that sort of thing. But not just that, it's the conversation with how the paint moves within those subjects, right? But the, the, the difficult thing I have is like connecting that with uh, like political engagement, right? Because those, uh, when I try to have those conversations, people seem to sort of just turn their listening ears off and, and I don't know how to like, you know, I mean, get it, some back and forth there. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I have to see you in action to give you a really effective, <laughs> customized answer yeah. because I'm just totally drinking the Kool-Aid when listening to you and I'm like, I want to see these. I mean, to me, it's very compelling in what you're describing and um, you could turn it around and say, so what, what kind of cityscape are you most familiar with? You know, and right. involve that person more. Um, so like and if it's a cityscape that you haven't worked with, you could say, wow, I need to put that on my docket to, to address. What can you tell me about that? Do you ever feel like you see enough trees? Oh. You know, or are you concerned about the climate crisis? And oh. I would do that a lot, you okay. know. And then they're so engaged, then you can hit them with it. Right. <laughs> that's, that's my strategy. Yeah. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> I'm also, I'm beginning to suspect that she's not as inept as she's like. <laughs> And that's why I kind of want to be like a hidden camera, GoPro or something, and just kind of like see what's actually going on. But yeah. um, maybe you can get a trusted friend that's not going to oversell or undersell your capability just to watch you in action. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because it seems like you need some more intel for what's going on. Maybe that person isn't really tuning out, but right. you're shaming yourself. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of good questions here to ask. Regardless, you're not satisfied, and that's valid. Yeah. That is totally valid. We just need to find strategies for you to begin to address it. And it may take time. It may not be like a, like a quick fix. But um, you're bringing up a question that every working artist has to address. Because we want that connection. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it can't just be the art. It can't just be the music. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, and you helped me deliver that on the money, on the, it's 6.15. That's what I was told we needed to land right on. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> I, I told her she didn't get to go yet. So, so she does. I'd like to actually invite my colleagues from Fry Street Quartet to join us on stage for just a moment, and we'll give them a moment to get here. And then we have a little memento to uh, present you with um, once everybody's here. We, we have for you, and one of our students will bring out shortly, a gift from the Kane College of the Arts. Um, it's a wood print by Professor Emeritus Marion Hyde, and uh, a little memento. It's actually a significant in size. <laughs> Um, Marion uh, was on the faculty here at Utah State for many years, grew up in Brigham City, and his woodcuts depict a lot of scenes around the state of Utah. We hope this print will serve as a reminder of the time that you spent with us and uh, the impact that you've had on all of our lives and careers. Thank you. actually happily box that up and send it um, to you if you like. <laughs>
Um, thank you so much. A, a few closing um, just statements of a little business here. Um, it's been wonderful to have this opportunity to come together as a community of artists and scholars and consider the service that uh, we can render to others through the arts. Um, Dr. Frank, your work over the last four years has been so transformational for many of us and we're grateful for the opportunities you've offered us and for the example and standard that you set. Even as your official residency ends, please know that the Kane College of the Arts is a better place for our association with you and the members of your academy. Thank you. Please also thank the members of the Fry Street Quartet, our pipe major, Anthony Earle, Kane College of the Arts Production Services, including Ricardo LaRanja, Eddie Myers, and their colleagues, and all our student technicians who are learning their work by working with some of the best in the business. Thanks to Event Services, USU Catering, and of course the Dean's Office staff, including Carrie Shoemaker, Kelly Bateman, and Dicey Lishman, and especially Elaine Olson, who took the lead on uh, tonight's program and the logistics. Thanks to all of you, faculty, students, staff, and donors, for your commitment to the Kane College of the Arts and to making the world a better place through your work. Please join us tomorrow night for a concert of Dr. Frank's music featuring the Fry Street Quartet, music faculty, and students. Tickets can be purchased in the lobby this evening. Um, thank you, thank you again for coming. And if you have a couple more questions for our guest, that's great because she'll be at a reception in the lobby. Please join us for a little bite and, and get some FaceTime with our guest. Thank you so much for being here tonight. some food. <laughs>